Welcome to this course on the basics of business loans. Business loans provide funds to grow a business, increase profits, and avoid cash crunches. Loans are a cash management tool that some use wisely and some misuse. They can help business growth explode or just blow up your business. In this course, I'll show you when to get a loan, the types of loans, how to properly use a loan, and what to watch out for. I'll start by explaining where businesses can get loans. This course focuses on loans from banks and credit unions, but I'll mention some other sources. Next, I'll define words used in the lending process so we all know what I mean as I talk about different loan types and structures. We'll go through different types of business loans and the appropriate uses of those types. I'll talk about loan underwriting, which is the process and criteria lenders use to decide whether to grant a loan. Sometimes a borrower is too risky for standard bank loans, so they are more likely to be funded via government programs like small business administration loans. I'll talk briefly about those programs. I'll explain the loan documents and point out important clauses in those documents. Auditors and accountants need to understand these documents to know the rights and responsibilities of the loan transactions of their client or employer. Finally, the grand finale will be a few slides on financial statement presentation and disclosures. This course focuses on the financial management aspects of loans, but I do explain the basics of the financial accounting and reporting for loans. I'm not a tax expert, so I don't get into the tax treatment for loans. Parts of this course are also used in courses that I provide to small business owners and their accountants. I'll usually refer to a company as your company, so those of you who are in public practice can translate that as your client's company. However, Parts of this course are specifically targeted to CPAs, and I don't include those parts in the courses I give to small business owners. I think you'll agree that a business owner checks out once we start making references to the ASC, which I'll do in the last part of this course. Before we dive into the materials, I wanted to give you a little about me and my background with banking. I'm Rob Stevens, and I'm currently the founder of CFO Perspective, which provides financial consulting and education to small business owners. I was previously the CFO of a couple banks and a community health clinic system. I've been on loan approval committees. I've also been on loan workout committees and special asset committees, which is what banks call the meetings where we discuss what to do with past due loans. The collections department at a $2 billion credit union reported to me. Long story short, I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly of business lending. Finally, yes, I have a CPA license, and so I know what it's like packing in these CPE courses to meet renewal requirements. In the first section of this course, I'll explain the times when you want to consider getting a business loan. I'll show you some quick tests that you can estimate whether your company has a large enough cash cushion or might run low over the next year. The most accurate way to assess whether you need a loan is to do a cash flow projection. I'll provide a template for this and talk you through how to use it. Now that you can find out your cash position, I'll explain how lending fits into business cash flows and the categories of the sources and uses of those cash flows. This information is useful both for you and to show lenders your ability to pay back any loan. Lenders will analyze your balance sheet and may do some of the metric calculations I'll be showing you. They will want to see your cash flow projections. Knowing your fluctuations in cash helps you and your lender determine the appropriate size for a line of credit. One of the most obvious times is when you are buying buildings or equipment. These require huge amounts of cash that few businesses have sitting in their bank accounts. Getting loans for these is easier than getting some other types of business loans because the building or equipment can be pledged as collateral to the lender. Closely related to buying property is constructing or improving a building. During the construction phase, the structure of the short-term construction loan you will receive is very different than the long-term loan once the construction is completed. I'll talk about the types of loans later in this course. A very common use is for short-term lending needs. For companies with healthy cash flows, it's more profitable to borrow money during times of net cash outflows and pay the short-term loan off during times of cash inflows. For example, many companies have regular patterns of large cash inflows from sales followed by big cash net outflows for payroll or to pay vendors. This is similar to the previous bullet, but the cash inflow and outflow cycles are much longer. Examples include seasonal businesses like landscapers, ski resorts, and hotels. I used to work at a bank that provided seasonal loans to farmers. Finally, some loans are used more for operating efficiency and ease than for cash flow reasons. 
Corporate credit cards are a very expensive way to borrow money if you don't pay them off each month. They are very useful though to allow employees to buy items, especially when they're buying things online. In the next few slides, I'll talk through four ways to estimate whether you need loans. The current ratio and quick ratio are two ratios to quickly compare your cash to future needs for that cash. If you are low on these ratios, getting longer term funding like real estate loans or funds from the owners may be good sources of cash. Reviewing past bank statements can show you how much your cash goes up and down within a month or across multiple months. Business lines of credit, which I'll explain later in this course, are good solutions for these cash fluctuations. Knowing the sizes of these fluctuations allows you to determine how big of a line you'll need. The current ratio is also known as the working capital ratio. It's calculated as current assets divided by current liabilities. It's a simple definition, but immediately leads to the question, what's a current asset and a current liability? Assets are things you own or have right to. Examples include cash or inventory and accounts receivable. Liabilities are things you owe, like payments to your vendors or lenders. These items are listed on your balance sheet. The word current means the asset will be converted into cash within a year or the liability will be paid within a year. Non-current assets and liabilities are all other assets and liabilities. Many accountants and accounting software create balance sheets grouped into current and non-current sections. Here's a sample balance sheet that shows how to calculate the current ratio. This is a classified balance sheet, meaning current assets and non-current assets are subtotaled within the assets section. Current assets are $600,000. Current liabilities are $350,000. So the formula is $600,000 divided by $350,000 for a current ratio of 1.71. Is 1.71 good or bad? I'll explain that in the next slide. A higher current ratio is better. Here's a quick way to assess your financial health with the current ratio. A working capital of one means your current assets are as big as your current liabilities. A working capital of less than one means your current assets are less than your liabilities. Whereas a current working capital of more than one means your current assets are more than your current liabilities. If your current ratio is one, meaning your cash inflows will cover your cash outflows, that's good, right? Well, it's good, but it may not be good enough. This formula is an estimate of future cash flows and has weaknesses that I'll soon explain. That's why many people recommend having a ratio between 1.2 and 2.0 to give yourself a cash cushion for unexpected cash needs. If you have consistently strong profits with good access to debt and equity, then you can have a lower working capital ratio. Some companies like Amazon have negative working capital ratios because of their financial strength and sophisticated cash management. Small businesses aren't Amazon, so it's better for you to keep working capital above one. A ratio above two may mean you can invest cash in your business, pay down debt, or distribute it to owners. Run a cash flow projection to confirm this and decide whether you want to keep the cash for safety or invest it for higher profits. The current ratio is one of the easiest ways to estimate if you have enough cash for the next year, but it has some weaknesses. It doesn't include cash you receive from profits or cash you will pay for losses that are reflected on your income statement. You won't receive and keep the cash from some assets that are traditionally classified as current. For example, your accounts receivable are constantly replaced with new ones, so they don't provide as much cash as you may think. Your inventory sold will be replaced with new purchases of inventory. Items like these are called permanent working capital and must be financed with long-term debt. The quick ratio is known as the acid test ratio. Frankly, that's a pretty extreme title for an accounting metric, but it sounds cool. It's calculated as current assets, less inventory, prepaid expenses and supplies, divided by current liabilities. This ratio removes some assets and is a tougher test for your cash flow than the current ratio. Like the current ratio, higher is better from a cash flow perspective. A common recommendation is for this to be equal to one or higher. Here's the same balance sheet we looked at earlier, but now we'll calculate the quick ratio. Current assets are $600,000, but we reduce that by the inventory balance of $300,000. Current liabilities are $350,000. So the formula is $300,000 divided by $350,000 for a quick ratio of 0.86. That's a little under one and may mean the company will be tight on cash in the future. 
Reviewing your daily cash balances from recent months can tell you if you have large cash fluctuations within a month. I know the head of a small company that received monthly financial statements that always showed decent cash balances. He went to write a check in the middle of a month and there was no cash. The bulk of his revenues were received near the end of the month. His month-end cash balances were fine, but he didn't realize how tight cash was mid-month. He got a line of credit to fix that. There are a few ways to get this info, and I go from low-tech to high-tech. One way is to review your paper bank statements. Another is to review the banking transactions either in your accounting system or your bank's online banking site. A third way is to download transaction histories from your accounting software or bank. You're first looking for patterns of when you have high points in cash and low points in cash. See if you can find any consistent times of the month when cash is high or low. These patterns will be useful for you when you make cash projections. Also calculate the differences between the high and low balances. This can give you an estimate for future months of how much cash will drop or rise. For example, if you know the difference is $100,000 and you have $80,000 in cash at a high cash point, there's a chance that you may need to borrow $20,000 by the time cash drops back to its low, $100,000 lower. I worked at a financial institution where our cash balances would pop up 10 to $25 million on the last day of every month. The day of the week the month ended on also greatly influenced whether the pop was closer to 10 million or 25 million. This knowledge helped me manage cash at month end. Reviewing monthly cash balances helps you identify seasonal trends and the size of those trends. You can look at bank statements, your accounting system, or an online banking site. You can use end of month balances or monthly average balances. Many business bank statements show an average balance for the month, which is a little better to use for this exercise. One year of data can show a potential trend, but looking at 24 to 36 months will tell you if the pattern is consistent year after year. When I worked at banks, I would submit a worksheet to the Federal Reserve of our monthly average balances over the past 36 months. They used this information to set the line of credit we had with them.